Patrick, thank you very much. Um, halfway through your introduction, I was thinking I'd make a quick exit from there. I don't know who, who you were talking about. Um, but uh, I'm really delighted to talk about a topic um, on which I've spent many hours, many nights and days uh, pondering and so on. So um, without further ado, let's, let's talk about healthcare for all uh, Americans. But before I start, I need to make some disclaimers. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm not even a registered voter. Um, I'm not a member of the American Medical Association. Many years ago, I realized I did not agree with their philosophy um, of uh, advocating or lobbying for, for more money. I'm not paid or funded by a pharmaceutical company or a health insurance company, not a stockholder, uh, not impressed by socialistic ideologies, etc. And I'm not a health policy expert, unlike many in this audience. Uh, I'm not even a health economist. I see Mick Tilford, my good friend, um, and so on. So, uh, but I do have some disclosures to make. Um, I am employed by UAMS. I practice at Arkansas Children's Hospital. I'm a member of various professional associations, but I speak on my own behalf, not for any of these. These are basically you know, several uh, associations dealing with pediatrics and critical care medicine and the International Association for Study of Pain. Um, I'm also receiving currently grant funds from the federal government for my research. Um, I'm on two advisory committees for the FDA. Um, I am a member of the American Board of Pediatrics, so in that sense, I get to play a role in um, setting the examinations and you know, ensuring quality of uh, the professionals that are trained in pediatrics. Um, I, I do work with people at the Harmony Health Clinic and also with an interfaith community service group. So the Harmony Health Clinic came out of a realization about two and a half years ago that there are many Arkansans who cannot afford health insurance, and who receive episodic care, who receive fragmentary care, really not appropriate for maintaining health or wellness. Um, we used to do these medical camps you know, in various parts of the city, which were very dissatisfying, because uh, we would see these people for the, the one time in their lives and there would be no follow-up. We would never know whether their hypertension or diabetes or you know, something else came under control. And it was you know, somewhat uh, concerning to me that are we, are we you know, causing damage rather than any good? And that's where Harmony Health Clinic, the idea for it uh, came out of. Um, this healthcare crisis affects many families and individuals, and this may be one of the solutions for part of the healthcare crisis here. However, what I think is, uh, what I'm trying to say today is that we should eliminate the need for Harmony Health Clinic. That's what this country needs. That's what we as Americans need. Um, so what this lecture is about is um, focusing on our healthcare system. Um, it's broken, uh, it's driven by special interests maybe somewhat unjust and unfair, et cetera, which has led to a healthcare crisis. Costs of healthcare are astronomical and are increasing at an alarming rate. If you thought the housing um, bubble was something bad, uh, w watch this. Um, the health of Americans is poor compared to other developed countries. There are huge disparities in healthcare across races in different communities. And whatever solutions we talk about must focus on the patient, must put patients first, um, must expand their choices and be cost effective. So that's, that's what I'd like to propose today. Here are data that recently show the growth of the uninsured population. And these data were released just recently in FY 2007. It's gone up 53 million. This was before the economic meltdown that we witnessed over the last month. Um, what's going to happen in 2008, 2009? 
um, your guess is as good as mine. But we do know that lack of insurance translate into lack of access. The uninsured will delay or oops, will delay or sacrifice care. Uh, they suffer chronic illnesses, may have a shorter life expectancy, and they tend to receive catastrophic care through the emergency medical services. The Institute of Medicine estimates about 18,000 people die prematurely every year simply because of the lack of health insurance. People in high income groups have a much longer life expectancy than those and a, and a much higher quality of life than those in the lower income groups. Everyone knows that. Um, this is another study that was released by the Center for Studying Health System Change. They made a comparison of access to health care in 2003 versus 2007. And these bars are for all people, insured people, uninsured people. So in, in 2007, there were 17.5% uninsured who had a health care need that could not be fulfilled, that their, their insulin could not be provided, their arthritis could not be treated. Um, there were about 20% who had to delay getting the necessary care that they needed. This is unacceptable, really, in our um, society today. Um, compared to other developed countries, we have the highest per capita health care costs, yet we have the highest infant mortality rate, health disparities, highest poverty rate, highest child injury death rate, highest death rate among smokers, and the highest number of workers without sick leave. Forty-seven percent of the U.S. workforce when they are sick, they have to choose between a day's of staying at home or a day's pay. And that, again, is, uh, is very inconsiderate. Um, per capita, we spend 3.2 times the amount that Japan spends on health. Yet we have um, a life expectancy that is uh, four and a half years shorter than Japan. If you think that is due to genetic differences between Japanese and Americans, think again because Pima Indians living in Arizona have more than 40% have diabetes. Just across the border, less than 7% have diabetes. Here's the life expectancy in years, Japan being the highest um, and the United States being the lowest. For some reason, it's cutting off the bottom of these slides. Can we, um, okay, anyway. Uh, but it is, it's, it's even below Chile and Korea, I can tell you. <laughs> um, here are rankings of infant mortality that were released uh, by the CDC recently and published in New York Times. And uh, what they showed that in 1960 was that the U.S. was 12th in the world for infant mortality. In 2004, it had dropped down to 31st in the world. The infant mortality rate, my friends, is a very sensitive marker for the effectiveness of our healthcare system. Infants are the most vulnerable. They are at the fringes of society. Whatever be the effective rate, uh, effectiveness of our healthcare system, this rate with a regular cadence will mark that. And you will see as our healthcare access and uh, programs improve, infant mortality rates will drop in this country. Um, there are huge disparities between races. Um, many are familiar with that. Uh, black men living in Washington, D.C. have a shorter life expectancy than black men living in Ghana or Bangladesh. David Satcher calculated 83,000 um, excess deaths occurred among blacks um, com if, if death rates were, were comparable between uh, blacks and whites. Uh, that's equivalent to shooting down a 737 carrying 240 passengers every day of the year. So this is, again, unacceptable. There are children living below the poverty line. There, the prevalence of HIV has doubled in the last 10 years, uh, but no change amongst, uh, uh, amongst whites or Latinos. <clears throat> Let's move from the crisis to costs. In 2007, the total health care expenditure per person was about $7,600. Total national health expenditures rose by about 7%, twice the rate of inflation. 
Employer-based health insurance also increased by about twice the rate of inflation, averaging 12,000 per year for a family of four, 4,400 for singles. Um, 2007 was the first year when the healthcare insurance was greater than the gross pay for a full-time minimum wage worker. Um, this is from the Rand Corporation. It's not surprising, therefore, that David Himmelstein from Harvard School of Public Health found that greater than 50% of all bankruptcies are attributed to medical bills. $35 billion of unpaid medical bills are passed on to the public. You and I will pay for them regardless, whether we pay for them with a health care tax or whether we pay for them you know, after the health care has been delivered. U.S. spending on health care is four times the amount spent on national defense, more than the amounts spent on food in this country. In 2007, the total spending was about $2.3 trillion. There was loss of productivity to the tune of $1 trillion. There was outsourcing due to health care costs and medical tourism projections were $1.7 trillion. This is $5 trillion we've lost in 2007 alone. This problem really needs to be solved. Um, where does all that money go? I'm sure many of you are wondering. Well, the beneficiaries of this expenditure are mainly health insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, device ma manufacturers. That's the golden trio. Um, there's also inpatient facilities and physician groups that have gotten a lot of the benefits of um, healthcare expenditure. But it's appalling to note that almost a third of healthcare costs are administrative. It's not just executive pay that contributes to this. It's the tens of thousands of um, the billing, coding personnel, the phone operators, the computer programmers, the, uh, the, the tens of thousands of people that are, are employed by the healthcare system where they have no role in the actual care that is delivered. And that's where this cost comes from. Today there are four companies, four insurance companies that cover 85 million people. That's more than 50% of the 160 million workforce that we have in this country. But that's not all. Um, here's projections for Medicare spending. And these are bars are indicating the the amount per, um, uh, as a proportion of the GDP. These are the beneficiaries that will, uh, the, the baby boomers are going to hit um, Medicare in the next two years. And so this will rise, um, uh, this proportion of people will rise. Medicaid, about 10 days ago, released their actuarial analysis um, to the, the secretary. And here's, here's the light gray line is the annual growth rate and this is the, ex the dark uh, line is the expenditures. And so here's actual, all this is actual expenditures. This is what is projected. Even if there is a static growth rate in Medicaid, these costs are going to escalate by the year 2017. Um, here is the Medicaid expenditure as a proportion of the GDP. By 2017, healthcare will take up almost 30% of the GDP. That's more than the government can spend on any programs, the more than the government spends on anything. And really, we need to take care of that. How? Well, uh, the, the events of the last 10 years in 2001, this is before 9-11, led the Nobel Prize winner in economics, Jan Tinbergen. And I'm sorry this is being cut off. I can see it on my slide here. But Jan Tinbergen said the only war worth fighting is the war against poverty. Uh, another um, prominent world economist said the fight against poverty demands a new economic ethic, the economics of unselfishness. But this is the one I like the most. Um, this is uh, from a Native American, a Kriu Indian, who says, <clears throat> Only when the last tree has been hewn, the last river has been poisoned, and the last fish has been caught, only then will you realize you cannot eat money. And that's what we need to focus on in our society today. Dr. Martin Luther King said, 
of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So here's what my thesis, my central thesis, is that universal healthcare should be a human right in this developed and civilized country. Healthcare will have to be rationed, but perhaps not by wealth or status, but in a logical, fair, and flexible manner, using love and compassion. What's the most loving thing we can do for our, our community or our country? And that's what should drive that. Short-term plans, tinkering with the healthcare system, shifting costs, moving people from one uh, basket to another is not going to change anything. Um, a healthcare plan should be easily understood instead of this morass of complexity that faces the, the client or the, um, uh, the person who ends up needing healthcare. It should empower people, be transparent, and ensure compliance in some way or another. So what are these proposed solutions? Well, we have several healthcare options. Every family has to decide how they're going to get their healthcare. But what's good for Uncle Sam is ultimately good for his children too, um, uh, unless uh, we want to uh, be part of uh, uh, you know, a plan that doesn't uh, address that. So the, the Uncle Sam plan will provide health care for all, will improve health outcomes, will put f patients and families first, will empower people with responsibility for their own health, will include some compliance measures, Without subsidization or compulsion, none of these programs will be successful. We'll eliminate the need for gaming the system, which occurs uh, massively currently today, and will decrease total health expenditures. And that's what we need to develop. Currently, our healthcare system has a disproportionate amount spent on tertiary care and secondary care. Uh, primary and preventive care is lost in the tumble, and there's a whole bunch of uh, uninsured people. What I'm going to propose is that the focus be on primary and preventive care. There should be um, uh, available secondary and tertiary care, and then there is a third tier which is called non-covered care, care for which you pay cash if you want it. So um, next couple of slides, I'll focus just on primary care. Currently, there is no primary care provider listed for a large percentage of our communities in, in the US. What I propose is that we have universal state-funded um, primary and preventive care to anyone who has or is eligible for a social security number. That's a place to start. I'm sure there are people who will argue about uh, what about the immigrants and so on. That is a separate issue that needs to be dealt with. It's no less important. But to start with, there should be universal uh, primary and preventive care available. It should include coverage for prenatal care, normal labor and delivery. It should have health maintenance for people with uh, chronic conditions. There should be a primary care provider recorded in a national electronic database, which every person is linked to a provider and that is their entry into the system. We also need to change this perception that a, a generalist or a, a uh, primary care provider provides a lower level of care than a specialist. In fact, that is not true. A generalist who knows the patient and their background will provide much better care than a combination of a cardiologist, nephrologist, pulmonologist, and endocrinologist. These are all people who are looking you know, through their little keyhole on one aspect of that per person's health. We need to expand access to rural areas through telemedicine and other uh, innovative programs that are ongoing in Arkansas. In fact, Arkansas has taken the lead in these areas. Um, what this will do is it will prevent disease progression and complications. It will reduce the use of emergency services and hospitals for primary care. It will provide the same level of care regardless of uh, anyone's ability to pay. It will also provide a conduit for health education, wellness programs, and rehabilitation. 
It should have incentives for weight reduction, smoking cessation, et cetera, et cetera. What if um, I was a smoker and I get into a smoking cessation program and my urine test says, uh, you know, I'm co I've been completely free for the past three months? Um, my copay would be 50% of what I would, you know, when accessing services. That is the kind of incentive that will uh, encourage people to take responsibility for their own health. Um, Tyler Zimmer um, uh, said, healthcare is not simply a commodity to be bought and sold according to the market, but rather it, it is a basic human need. As such, it should not be limited to only those who are able to pay for it. And, and that's what I propose as primary care. Come to the second tier. This is secondary and tertiary care. All individuals must be required to obtain a basic level of health insurance. There are people who would pay for you know, cable television and not pay for insurance. And those temptations are always going to be there. However, it is the need of the hour that every individual obtain some form of health insurance. There should be a variety of products available depending on age, health status, individual needs and preferences, whereby the, the healthy and the wealthy may subsidize care for the poor and the sick, but the average earner having the average health will pay enough insurance to take care of their health care needs. And that's the way the system will best function. It should include coverage for specialty care, surgery, hospitalizations. Employers must offer health insurance or make payments into a state fund to allow the state to uh, provide that. We should expand the use of pre-tax health savings accounts, um, the cafeteria 125 plan or other things that allow people to defer part of the costs. There should be subsidies for those who cannot afford to pay and catastrophic illness coverage for those who are below 200% of the federal poverty line. The costs that are covered by this insurance should be based according to evidence-based medicine. We should also, for doctors who are practicing evidence-based medicine, we should limit uh, malpractice damages or make them immune from malpractice if they are providing standard care, which is currently accepted. We should place some caps on maximum health insurance benefits, except for specific lifelong conditions. For example, someone needs dialysis for the rest of their lives. There should be those specific exceptions allowed. There must be limits on allowable corporate profits and executive pay. You cannot imagine the degree of growth that has occurred in the last 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry sector and in the health insurance industry sector. In comparison, wages of the average American have not risen. Healthcare costs have gone up. Employers have given more in terms of their employer uh, portion of the health insurance plan. But what, what does that do? That can only come from reducing wages or increasing the prices of their products, which is basically reducing wages in a roundabout way because you have less buying power or reducing profits. Profits have not been reduced. It's the buying power and the wages that have, uh, have suffered. So there, there have to be some limits on allowable corporate profits and executive pay. We should require insurers to accept people, regardless of their health status, with proportions based on the local healthcare market that, that a health insurance company is serving. So that if there are 15% people with chronic conditions in Little Rock, then Qualchoice must have 15% of their clientele with chronic conditions um, so that people cannot be turned away. And there should be some way to set prices on medical services and prescription drugs. I don't know if this will come through, but I'll just read this. This is a quote from David Blumenthal, and it's being cut off at the bottom. He says, in our decentralized a decentralized pluralistic system, no single purchaser has the market power or political authority to impose cost controls. And this is from the, the Institute for Health Policy at, uh, at Harvard um, that David Blumenthal um, uh, opined. Part of what will make this tier of uh, care work 
is if we can create an independent mechanism for evaluating the comparative cost effectiveness for drugs, devices, diagnostic tests, and treatment procedures. There are so many new drugs being introduced, so many new devices, everything designer, everyone wants to practice the latest by the latest endoscope and, and so on. These offer at best marginal, if no advantages, over tried and trusted and much cheaper therapies. There is no there is no independent mechanism. The way people find out about these new products is from the people who are marketing those products. Of course, they are going to give you a very different picture. Uh, we should require health organizations to have the infrastructure that incorporates these types of technology assessments into current practice. They should have the relationships. They should have the, the mechanisms. They should have the processes in place that very quickly, once a comparative cost effectiveness uh, analysis has come out, be incorporated into what is acceptable practice. We need to implement information technology to provide care away from hospitals or metro areas with access to medical records across different sites of care. And we need to create payment systems that will reward preventive care, care coordination, and health outcomes rather than just paying for the services that are provided. Every doctor knows that you know, doing an extra diagnostic test is going to support the healthcare system. But um, uh, the, there are needs for doing that because of some of the malpractice uh, uh, environment that we practice in, as well as the inherent uh, advantages to the system. Coming to the third tier. This is non-covered care. These are designer drugs, unnecessary surgery, unproven or experimental therapies. Why should I pay as a taxpayer for Botox injections for people who are in the entertainment industry or, or whatever reason? These should be self-pay, or they should be paid through research grants, or be paid by drug companies, or, or even supplemental insurance with high deductibles and high premiums. Um, there is clearly the need for drug companies to do some post-marketing subsidization of costs. What happened with Vioxx? The studies were done. The, the product got approved by the FDA. And then it needed a few million people to be treated in order to have the statistical power to be able to detect those side effects that have a very low rate amongst the population. So, why not have uh, the new um, you know, antidepressant released and have the drug company fund the first two million people that are treated with that drug? That should be part of the approval process that uh, goes into this. Um, we should also reduce ICU-based end-of-life care. 27% <clears throat> of the Medicare expenses are spent on the last six months of life. There should be ways to consider home-based or hospice-based care, limit surgical procedures, limit the duration of CPR if, if there's no hypothermia, or implement what's called the Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment Program nationally. This is a program where each patient writes out what is the life-sustaining treatment that they want at the end of their life. And it's been adopted by five different states. It really needs to be expanded nationally, including in our state. So in summary, this plan provides uh, for primary and preventive care, which is free of cost to all Americans, provides for secondary and tertiary health care through various health care insurance products, both state-funded and private, and provides for non-covered health care through self-pay research grants or other promoters. This, I believe, is a system that will put patients and families first, will be patient-centered, will require a modified regulatory frame, framework and tort law, and we'll have, we will have to build into it some checks and balances into this proposed system. I'll close with a, a quote from Sri Satyasai Baba. He says, remember always that it is easy to do what is pleasant, but it is difficult to be engaged in what is beneficial. Success comes to those who give up the path strewn with roses and brave the hammer blows and sword thrusts on the path fraught with difficult choices. So there are some difficult choices we will have to make. 
And with that, I'd like to open this up for discussion. We have a couple of mics pass around, so raise your hand. We'll start with you, ma'am. Uh, why do you not recommend a single payer system? Yeah. Good point. Uh, um, I don't recommend a single player system in this plan, um, although moving towards one would be a, a gradual process. I, I think um, that's basically what uh, the primary care would do is provide care to all regardless of their income or, or their status and, and so on and um, have that uh, be funded through the, the health care uh, taxes. I can tell you systems like that in England or Canada or the Netherlands have universal coverage and they have a much higher satisfaction. You know, uh, there, was a, a recent, um, there was a recent study done on satisfaction with the health care system. 55% of people that's almost a little over half. 55% were satisfied with the healthcare system. You know, almost half of those who access the system are not satisfied with it. And, and I agree, this, this is a decentralized and a pluralistic system, and that allows the inequities to creep in. So yes, gradually we will need to move towards a single payer system, and, and the AMA is now uh, recommending that. The, um, uh, there was the... Um, Physicians for National Health uh, in, uh, Programs is another uh, sort of a group that is recommending that. Uh, but that is something that needs to be, uh, you know, a phased in kind of a process. Next question. Right back here. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk. I actually have a, a couple of questions. I'll try and make them quick. First of all, I'm a little concerned when you talk about uh, in your secondary and tertiary, um, not covering, it looked like you would not cover catastrophic illness for those with more than 200% of the federal poverty, poverty line. Is that, did I hear you correct on that? Well, basically that would be part of the insurance plan. You see, we all buy car insurance. We're all required to have a liability insurance if we have a car. Um, and so healthcare insurance products should be available to be as gold-plated or as silver or bronze-plated as you want them. And, and that would be um, uh, part of the, the secondary and tertiary care. You, you buy the insurance, you pay, uh, and you get what you pay for. Next question. Uh, my name my name is Faisal, a uh, Clinton School student. Um, um, do you think there is already, there is already uh, enough effort put in place to, um, you know, program like uh, disease prevention, uh, promotion of um, healthier lifestyle or something like that? Because I think uh, instead of uh, giving treatment to, to people who are sick, it is much easier and much more important. So do you think it, is, it has become a priority? Thanks. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. The priority and the focus must be on preventive care, on, on health and wellness rather than, you know, on sickness. And um, our healthcare system has, uh, you know, if you look at life expectancy, okay, life expectancy improved by about 25 years from 1900 to 1960. Life expectancy from 1960 to 2000 actually is going down. And that's the period when National Institutes of Health and a number of you know, the major advances have occurred. Why did life expectancy improve in the first 60 years of the last century? It's because of social programs. You know, the eight hour work week, the um, uh, social programs that were put into place during those first 60 years had a major impact. So in that sense, you know, the, the availability of education for all, um, those were the kinds of things that made a big difference. And uh, 
the, all the technology and all the innovation put together has done remarkable things, no doubt, uh, uh, for specific diseases or conditions, but has had minimal, if any, impact on life expectancy you know, in, in our modern times. So you're right, absolutely. Let's put the focus, instead of on sickness, let's put it on wellness and health. And that's what the, the incentive programs would do. The incentive programs would incentivize people for maintaining healthier lifestyles, but would also intensivize practitioners for encouraging those healthier lifestyles. Um, a, a primary care practitioner who has you know, 200 people with hypertension will be incentivized if they are maintaining their um, salt-free diet and maintaining their blood pressure levels and, and so on. But if, if a significant proportion of those patients develop a stroke, you know, that would be a de-incentive because there's something has been missed in that, that patient's total care that the provider um, you know, needed to include. That's, that's what we hope to do at Harmony Health Clinic is not simply provide primary medical care and dental care, but also include health education, also include you know, an improvement of, uh, or an encouragement to healthier lifestyles. You're absolutely right. That's where we have to focus. This question, Demas. You first, ma'am. I agree with you in some respects, Sonny, but I probably have a few, few comments. And you really do have to concentrate on this whole idea of prevention. If you never smoke, you'll never have the diseases. And I can go down, down the list. Now, it takes more than just what the public perceives as the healthcare system. Health is not the, not the major issue in medical care. And that's a difference. That's a difference that's been there for a long time. We doctors go to medical school to, quote, heal the sick. Yes. And so what we have, and that's wonderful, and that's fine, but we also have to begin to have medical schools that teach a different game. They have to teach the idea that yes, we are responsible to supervise healthcare, the health of our patients. We are responsible to contribute to the community in terms of health maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, as prevention is one of the major ways to control the cost. I think that one of the major ways to promote health is health education in public schools not talking about condoms and not talking about all that uh, stuff that people hate to talk about. I'm talking about comprehensive health care and health education. Teach kindergartners how to wash their hands, how to take care of their teeth, and you gradually increase what they do. Then they will have less of the preventable diseases and have some better ideas about to take care of themselves. I'm a little concerned when you say that primary care should, quote, be free. Generally speaking, if you give me something free, I say it's of no value, or you wouldn't be giving it to me free. So I'm not so sure that I like that from that standpoint. The other standpoint is we are having a tremendous amount of trouble getting our physicians to go into primary care because of the, the differential in how much they get rewarded. Instead of making it free and making those providers, what all they do is give free care, type attitude, no. I think we have to begin to teach that the most valuable physician Question. in any circumstance is the general, the generalists, mm -hmm. because they're the ones that are going to take care of it. And my second thing is... One more question, ma'am. We need to get right. the question. <laughs> and well, and the second point is that controlling the cost by having everyone a member of health, everybody having health insurance is not going to control the cost. How are you going to put out a system that will truly begin to have enough teeth in it to make the thing work across the board. Costs, malpractice, education, you can go on forever. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Um, you know, doc, Dr. Lowe is uh, past president of the American Academy of Pediatrics and, and for many years, she's the one who rec recruited me to Arkansas. So um, I, I, I do respect uh, uh, the, those comments really. Um, we, you know, in, in places like Sweden, for example, people have this national you know, insurance card. Without that, you can't rent an apartment. You can't buy groceries if you don't have health insurance. You know, that's, those are the, and like I said, without subsidization and without compulsion, 
no system is going to work. Um, so some degrees of subsidies will be required and some degree of compulsion to be part of that system will be required. And, and I totally agree with you. But, but we as a society need to work out those conditions and to work out, you know, without curtailing the freedoms that we are accustomed to, how do we get people to uh, participate in this healthcare system so that the health of all Americans improves? Demis. How are you, Demis Espinal? I'm a Clinton School student. Uh, I know you're not Republican or Democrat, but I was just wondering what your thoughts were on the Obama and McCain health care plans. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have about another hour? <laughs> um, in, in short summary, I think uh, um, the Senator Obama's plan has a few of the ingredients um, uh, that will make um, uh, the health system more effective. Uh, Senator McCain's plan uh, really has very little, um, very little of, you know, hard value, hardcore value. Um, he talks about, you know, information technology and, and things like that, but how, how are those things going to be implemented? He talks about going across state borders and, uh, you know, with health insurance and so on. Basically what that is going to do is it's going to shift people who get health insurance into non-group, you know, category of people where they have the least negotiating power and where the, the deductibles are the highest and the quality of care that is delivered is the lowest. So, so there, are, there are some differentials in those plans, but neither one of those really takes a comprehensive look at our health care system. Right here. <clears throat> Uh, the U.S. prides itself on kind of the American Western independence mentality. And I think you see that in education standards where you have local control. And it takes pride to the point it's a diminishing return. We have cities in Arkansas that have, do not have fluoridated water, you know, Hot Springs, Fort Smith, other major cities. Um, so if you're presuming some level of consistency across, this, across either the state, maybe not even the nation, your health care results are going to vary based upon some shared decision that a community makes, whether that's logical or ignorant. Yeah. So um, how do you factor the American West mentality in the independence factor to get a common blanket of understanding across this country. Yeah, yeah, that, those, those are huge, um, uh, that, you know, that itself is a huge barrier to um, getting a healthcare system that is equitable and that is similar across um, all communities in, in uh, yeah, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole thing will rest with, um, People uh, who are in government and their intermediaries, to some extent, having the political um, uh, or, or taking the, the political uh, uh, cost, literally, or the political damage um, for doing the right thing. Um, and there are few, uh, but there are, there are principled people um, you know, in leadership today uh, who will do the right thing, regardless of what it is. So, first of all, we need to have some understanding of what is the baseline. Where do we draw, wh what is the, the, you know, the ground level? And those kinds of public health initiatives um, uh, that are aimed at, you know, all sectors of our population are, are crucially important. On top of that, and, and so, you know, every, Every few months, I get from the uh, National in Institute for Healthcare a a Excellence in, in the UK a, a booklet that summarizes the best evidence. You know, and every two or three months, they will put out, here's the best evidence today, here's an update. Um, we don't have anything um, in the, the National Institutes of Health has this huge, you know, $20 billion budget 
but there is no place where a technology assessment can tell me whether this defibrillator is any improvement, which costs $30,000, by the way, uh, is any improvement over the $5,000 def defibrillator that was available last year. Um, there's, there's no place. So those kinds of mechanisms really need to be put into place. And then, uh, you know, once we have the cost effectiveness analysis, um, people will automatically realize, if I have to pay $30,000 out of pocket, I'd go with that other defibrillator. Thank you. One more question, Lindsay. Hey, Dr. Anand, thank you for coming to share with us today and, and for your leadership with, with the Harmony Clinic. When we look at this debate, we have you know, a large group of the uninsured, but we also have a large group of those who are underinsured. We know that the research shows that the underinsured have almost the same outcomes as the uninsured. So when we look at how we reform our health system, how do we do it in a way that can address both groups? And, and just somewhere that we're not taking the uninsured and simply raising them to underinsured status. How do we do that? Uh, Lindsay, that's probably the toughest question. Um, and uh, and no, no less expected uh, from you. Um, I, I think uh, the, the, um, the key issue is going to be, you know, how are we going to expand the coverage um, and, and have a basic minimum level of, of insurance that everyone has and everyone is capable of buying. And I, I think once those basic standards are in place, you know, gradually those standards can be raised based on evidence-based medicine, you know, uh, or driven by evidence-based medicine as how we can, you know, gradually. So, so let's get everyone on a level playing field first, and then we sort of raise the platform from there um, onwards. Well, that's all the time we have. Let's thank Sunny for presenting once again. Thank you.